Boker Tov, everybody. Uh, a pleasure to see everybody. Like I said, it's the first time I'm home for this year and like uh, since before Pesach, but uh, okay, nice to see you. Um, the year today is dedicated to the memory of my, my father, Rav, uh, Rav Chaim Yosef and Rav Tzvi Huda, Rav, Rabbi Joseph Kelman. I'm sure many of you, of course, knew him uh, the, in, in Canada, served as a rabbi for over 50 years. Uh, here and uh, we remember last week uh, I sponsored in memory of uh, my mother. Their yard sites are basically are, are ten years and one week apart. One week apart, ten years. My mother passed away first, and my father passed away ten years later. But Neshama uh, should have an aliyah. We should have many happy yeah. occasions. May their Neshama have an aliyah. Thank you, thank you. Okay, I figured since today is Canada Day. Um, for those who are unaware of that, and perhaps living in the United States, uh, July the 1st, I always actually use this as an example of, um, you know, the first Mishnah, Arba Rosh Hashanim Heim. There are four Rosh Hashanahs, there are four New Years, or, you know, you tell the person, like, we, we have two calendars. We have a calendar that starts in Nisan and a calendar that starts in Tishrei. The New Year is on the seventh month. Rosh Hashanah in the Torah is not called Rosh Hashanah. It's called the first day of the seventh month. So it's a little bit strange. How do you have a New Year on the first day of the seventh month? So if you teach in Canada, that's very easy to do, because today is the first day of the seventh month, July the 1st, and it's a New Year. Canada is turning 155 years old today. So it's uh, it's it's a new year, so you see, this actually works out. First day, seventh month. It's actually an exact parallel. But uh, we have all kinds of years, fiscal years and uh, sports years and et cetera. And, of course, the school year, I was listening. We were away. We were in the New York area last week. So on the way back, we were listening to a podcast. So the guy was saying, you know, he always thinks of a year. It starts the day after Labor Day. You can be 50 years old, but when does the year start? The year starts the day after Labor Day because that's how our, you know, our childhood is that uh, the new the new school year. So that is interesting. That uh, so we have we have many new years. Um, um, it, of course, it is interesting that Rosh Hashanah is the first day of the seventh month. We're not going to talk about that now. But basically, uh, the middle of the year is the best time for a new year. In other words, if you're going to do do tshuva, if you're going to reflect on the year, the best time to do it is right in the middle because we've had enough time to sort of assess what's going on. You have enough time to improve on what's going on. That's why Rosh Hashanah is really the first day of the seventh month but um i figured i'll spend I, I, we, we won't spend the whole year on this i at least i, I sure hope not but we'll spend uh, the first part of it i just want to figure out we'll talk a little bit on tefillah shlom ha medina um i think uh especially with what's going on in the world i think lots and lots of people are upset at their governments for very good reasons whether that's in the united states in israel i'd say in canada a little bit less yes you don't have to be a fan of the government but thank god we don't have the same whatever craziness that you have in other countries and the political systems. I just want to point out a few things on uh, on the prayer for the government, which is a requirement. It's uh, the Mishnah is very clear. So I just want to show you uh, the origins. Maybe people are aware. We'll spend a few minutes doing this. Uh, just let me go here. Okay, let me share my screen. So it begins with the book Sefer Yirmiyahu. Uh, where are we going here? Okay, let me find it. I don't find it. I, know, I always find this hard to move around. Okay, give me one second. I don't know why this doesn't work. Uh, okay, Yirmiyahu 29. Okay, Yirmiyahu, of course, um, Rabbi Liebtag is starting a series on Sunday on Yirmiyahu when politics and religion collide. Yirmiyahu, of course, is the prophet who uh, witnessed the destruction of the first Beit HaMikdash. You weren't to Tammuz already. So Tammuz, uh, the three weeks. Um, and he, of course, is uh, is traditionally assumed to be the author of Eicha. That's uh, Megillat Eicha. Um, and here you have Yirmiyahu um, saying, sending this book. He sends this, uh, you know, letter from Yerushalayim. He's going to tell to the people who were just exiled, the Sher Haglan Nebuchadnezzar. That's, a, you know, we say that in Megillat Esther. Uh, you know, Mordechai was uh Ben Yair Ben Kishi Shiminiya Shirhagla in Melak Bavel. So um he sends them a letter and he says, This is what God says. Komar Shem Sfadel Hisrael Kholakola. This is to the entire exile. Remember, this is an unbelievable moment. In other words, we don't know. Or let's put it this way: I don't think the Jews living then knew if they would would survive as a people. Why why should they survive as as a people? They've been in the land for eight hundred and fifty years. That's how long they were till the first base of Mikdash is destroyed. And uh, you know, yeah, we talk about yeah, the prophets promised they'll never be 
um, um, you know, destruction of, of the Jewish people. I, I don't know that the Jewish people were uh, had that in the in their mindset. And nations, you know, came and disappeared all the time. So there's absolutely no guarantee. At least I don't think, from as far as the Jewish people are concerned, they would survive. So you, you but Yermio says to the exiled people. You know what? Build homes. Don't uh, don't sit there mourning and uh, you know and al or whatever. I mean that that too. But uh, you have to build homes and dwell in your homes. Nitu ganot, plant your garden, water your lawn. That flowers, nice. You know, it's the nice season. Ichlu at period. This is very interesting. They've just been exiled. No, we fast on Tisha B'av. But he's telling them, you come to 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 Babel, uh, have a nice life. Kahuna Hashim get married. Remember the Gemara in Baba Batra quotes that there were Jews who said they don't want to get married. And with the destruction of the temple, who wants to bring kids into the world, right? After the Holocaust, who wants to bring kids into the world? Such an awful world. Why, right? Miriam telling her father, right? The famous Gemara that Amram separated from his wife. So it's very, uh, you have to tell people. As a matter of fact, the, the Poskim quote this as a, uh, a reason why today we don't force people to get married. I don't know how you would do that even if you wanted to, and I'm not saying I would want to, but uh, in theory, the halacha says you force somebody to get married. And in theory, you force a person to get divorced if they're having had children after 10 years. We don't follow these halacha anymore. Thank God, I'll say. And um, so uh, um, we, don't, we don't do that. So one of the, the justifications given is this Gemara that, you know, uh, why do we have to have kids anymore? After the destruction, uh, who needs kids anymore? So even though we don't follow that, because the Gemara says that's that's crazy, we'd exterminate the, the Jewish people. But uh, nonetheless, that's used as, you know what, it's not, uh, we have such an idea. Such an idea exists and in our tradition, you shouldn't have. But that's not normative Judaism. And Yirmiyahu says, get married. Uh, people have to know they get married. Holidu banimu banot. Have, have, have children, let them get married, et cetera. So yeah, and here's the pasuk that talks about Tilal Shlomo Medina, Dershuat Shlomo Ir. You have to seek out this, the peace of your city. I think the, the, the uh, you know, back to back, it's just unbelievable. In other words, even though you were exiled, these are like evil people, Babylonia. We don't like the Babylonians. You know, they destroyed our, our temple. They exiled us. They killed many Jews. Nonetheless, you're living there. You have to seek out the peace. Yeah, they're the ones who are exiled. Be Bellalu. It's not, and you have to pray, not only, you know, to be a nice citizen and not to cause any problems, you actually actively have to pray. El Hashem, keep your shalom. That's, uh, that's, uh, you want a nice, peaceful life because that's good for everybody. So that, that, this is the, uh, of course, this is the original source, what gets picked up in the Mishnah, Perkei Avot, having mipalel b'shloma shamalchut. You have to pray for the welfare of the kingdom. So uh, the first important point to note is we pray for the welfare of the kingdoms we don't like. It's no, uh, obviously, if you uh, if you like, if the, we'll get to in a minute, you know, in a, in a moment, if the kingdom is really, really, really nice to the Jews and wonderful, well, that's obvious. In other words, the, the insight, the obligation is to pray for even the Babylonians. Now, I'm sure many of people are aware here, I'm sure. I, I don't, I didn't uh, get the, I could find it, whatever, but I, I didn't get the whole sorts. The, um, they used to pray for the czar in, in Russia, and they used to mention him by name, Tsar Nicholas. And they would uh, mention, if you go to England, I think I've been thinking for a long time, but I believe they blessed the Queen Elizabeth and Prince Charles and, uh, you know, um, the, here we don't tend to do that, uh, whatever. I, mean, I don't know if it's right or wrong, but um, the, the Mishnah, the Halakh is not explicit how to do it. But obviously, uh, you, you know, it's it's nicer for the king or the queen if you mention their, their names. How much of that was done out of, you know, for self-interest? That really doesn't matter. I mean, even your meow admits you'll have peace. You pray for the peace of the government, that'll be good. So the fact that somebody doesn't like a government is no excuse not to pray for its welfare. Um, I imagine like everything in the world, there are exceptions. If you're living in Nazi Germany, it's uh, probably a little bit, bit different. But even in, in nations where the Jews are not treated well, um, we know that um, anarchy is worse. You know, we, we may not like how China, whatever, runs the, you know, their authoritarian government. 
but I think uh, I don't know. I've, I've never been there. I've never been to Hong Kong, and I have no desire to go. But uh, I think the the society, in other words, you can walk on the street. You know, there's not people there the crime rates aren't uh, crazy there there's a authoritarian government so that or there's authority in the government the fact that they're authoritarian is is a different problem so that's uh, i think just a very important point to note that um the importance of praying now um you have the same idea yona yona hanavi the yom kippur yom kippur afternoon right the most important ali of the year you know give the guy after yona you know that's always the expression i wouldn't give him after yona but okay, he's a nice guy, you know. But um, so, um, uh, wh wh what's Ninva? What's Ninva? Uh, that quote, somebody's testing me in Yirmiyahu, is chapter 29. The actual quote is verse 7. I went to sort of the first seven verses, but the actual quote is tr it's chapter 29 in the book of Yirmiyahu. I mean, where it's not like the Babylonians exiled us like 100 years ago. This is like, you know, this is like saying to a Jew, uh, you know, to pray for the welfare of, of Germany after World War II. Now, that, that is true. Ger Germany is um, a different Germany. So, um, you know, but yeah, yeah, then the, the Jews were exiled to Bavel. And th these are the Jews who were alive, who were living in Jerusalem and were exiled. I'm sure some of them had family members who were killed. And yet they were uh, instructed by Yirmiyahu in the name of God, Komar Hashem. So God says, you have to pray for the welfare. It's just but it's done in a very practical sense. It's not, um, he says, you know, uh, you're going to live, you, you want to live a nice life. You want to build homes, get married, have kids, have nice gardens, uh, et cetera. That's all great. But you know what? You want peace in the land. And the way that peace then pray for the government, you know, uh, et cetera. Now, um, and they, say, Yona, they say the idea that um, God sends Yona to, to Nineveh. So Nineveh, that's the uh, capital of Assyria. <clears throat> Um, Yonah sent approximately, I don't know, 760, maybe 770. Tomorrow's the yard site of the Lubavitcher Rebbe, so we can use the number 770. Uh, 40, 50, 60 years before. Um, and in 721 BCE, um, Sancheriv, the king uh, Melech Ashur, exiles the 10 tribes, and uh, that's why there are only 12 million Jews in the world, because 85%, 83% of the Jews got uh, lost to Jewish history 2,700 years ago. So that's it. God finished. Finished. No, there's no uh, no Asher, Zulun, Dan, Naftali, Binyamin. Uh, they don't exist anymore. So um, so that's um, so uh, he exiled. And nonetheless, nonetheless, God tells Yonah, you know what? Go do go tell them to do tshuva, so I don't have to destroy them. When, when we we would never. You begin to understand why Yonah now. He, Yonah, I mean, he was a prophet, but I don't know if he. I don't know that he had prophecy that they were going to come and destroy. Uh, exile the, the 10 tribes, but you understand he knew that this is a problem. Why are we going to pray? Why are we going to help? It's like today, the Jews going into Gaza and praying for the people in, uh, in I don't know, uh, you know, to, to, to do tshuva so God will, uh, will pr protect you. It, it, it's not the way uh, we think, but uh, that's the way, I don't know, what can I tell you? Unless somebody has another explanation, that's the way the, the Torah thinks. But what I do want to point out is Again, these are practical. With Yona, I don't know. With Yona, it's more philosophical. In other words, they're created in my image. You know, God gets upset. He doesn't want to. He, God gets upset when the angels are singing, when the Egyptians are drowning. All human beings are created in the image of God. You want all human beings now. I, I would have been ideal had they done tshuva and not destroyed uh, the, the ten tribes. But okay, so what can you do? If we can get them to partially do tshuva, that's what uh, we're supposed to do. So that's... Um, that's, um, you know, that's, you see, I think it's quite fascinating that uh, Yona, and like I say, it gives perspective on Yona, why he doesn't want to do such a thing. Like it, he wasn't going to stand like a, go to, to New York City on to Times Square and tell people, you know, have a little bit more, uh, I don't know, whatever, whatever examples you want to use, whatever place you want to go. Okay. Um, but what I, I don't want to add, like I said, these are practical things very much, at least in Sefer Yirmiyahu, um, and in Perkei Avot, for sure, where Rabbi Hanina says, pray for the peace of the government, if not for the fear of the government, and I think they're probably Yira, even though I always translate it as awe, I, I think in that case, it really does mean fear, unless you have fear of the government, people are going to swallow each other alive. Yeah, anarchy is the worst system. Even terrible totalitarian states are better than anarchy. What's like the most messed up country in the world today? Probably Lebanon. 
Well, Lebanon is the most messed up country because uh, there's total anarchy uh, it's, and uh, whatever. So, uh, you know, anyways, that, so that's the practical level. Ramosha Feinstein, of course, takes it a step further. Ramosha Feinstein, Libya. Okay, I, I, I'm not, uh, don't quote me 100%. Lebanon is one of the most messed up countries in the world. Um, so, and I'm not even talking, obviously they have Hezbollah, terror, I'm not even talking on that angle. I'm just talking for, you know, the way the country doesn't function and their, their currency and people are, are starving. It used to be the Switzerland of the Middle East, right? When I was a little kid, Lebanon was no, I think that's what they, they used to call it, the Switzerland of the Middle East. Yeah, okay. Anyways, um, yes, we moved to Adam Hussein. Uh, you can all give better examples. Okay, um, but Rav Moshe, Rav, Rav Moshe, the great uh, post I always say, the greatest halachic authority ever to step foot on this side of the Atlantic. Um, Rav Moshe Feinstein comes to America in 1937. I was driving last week on the FDR drive to, to drop off our son to go to camp. And I mentioned to my son, he, he's 16 years old, uh, you know, the, he, does, he really hasn't been on the FDR drive much. And uh, I don't know if everybody here has been on the FDR drive. That's a, goes along the east side of Manhattan, just along the side. So I said, you know, the FDR, you can see, if you go far enough, you can see Rav, Rav Moshe's apartment. Rav, Rav Moshe moves to the Lower East Side and he never leaves. He never leaves. The, I think he comes in 1937 he dies in 1986 and he lived his whole life on the lower east his whole life the second part of whatever his life he lives on the on the lower east side and uh walked around the lower east side a little bit you know i'm i don't know are there people here who grew up on the lower east side and you can you can, can let me know it's not the same i don't know there's no no schmuck bernsteins anymore i don't know that's what i think of when i was a kid from the lower east side or the pickle man i don't know whatever they had anyways so rav, rav moshe rav moshe had an remember he escapes from russia from the communists in Russia in 1937. That's where Rav Moshe is. It was, uh, it was not so easy to get out of Russia. And, uh, and I don't know if people are aware, um, Zev Elif, I think, wrote an article about this a number of, of, of years ago. You know, America, when we were in New York, the last time we went to, over Pesach, we went to uh, Ellis Island. I haven't been there for a long time. And the Statue of Liberty and the whole story, it's very beautiful. You know, two, two million Jews come from... Uh, from Europe from 1881 to 1924. In 1924, the U.S. basically stops immigration. The, the people, they, we don't want these uh, low lives coming in. But it's you know, no different, whatever. You make your own conclusions. But uh, it was very hard to get into the United States after 1924. There was an exception for clergy people. And that's why people like Rabbi Soloveitchik and Levar and Cutler, I mean, all the great, um, the, the, the Lubavitcher Rebbe, all the people who saved Judaism, the, that great generation of, after World War II, where, Rav, you know, where we, we as Rav Soloveitchik answered the question, why was our generation merit to have the state of Israel? We're not greater than many other generations. Well, what is it about it? And Rav Soloveitchik says, said, we needed it. Uh, other generations could survive in their Judaism without it state of Israel. After the Holocaust, in order to give the Jewish people some form of hope, some um, position, you know, to go on, we need it. It's, it's such a beautiful, insightful, and powerful answer. That's, uh, obviously, we don't know the ways of God, but that was just, we needed it. And, and that generation had rabbis like uh, we don't have today. The 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 leadership, whether, you, you know, the Lubavitcher Rebbe, Rav Arn Kutler, Rav Soloveitchik, uh, all these people who, who built up Judaism in America in an unbelievable ways, and all very different and each in their own way, Ramosha Feinstein in this way, halachically, but uh, he wasn't the leader in the same way. But anyway, Ramosha Feinstein had the tremendous appreciation of America. We don't pray for the government just because we want peace. And uh, of course, that's true. We pray, Ramosha said, because it's a malchut shel chesed that it's a kingdom of kindness, that America is just uh, so kind, because that's not the way Jews lived for 2000 years. You know, it was very, even in the golden age of Spain, Jews were second class, you know, you know, citizens. The idea that Jews have voting rights and citizenship, we take it all for granted. We were all brought up that way and uh, we would be appalled. Uh, look, you know, look at the reaction when abortion rights are taken away. People are uh, uh, you know, appalled. Um, but uh, that, that's Jews were never treated well, uh, so well. So he had a tremendous idea. And I think it's something important to remember, despite all the uh, legitimate complaints we may have against our governments, um, it's still, there's probably no better time to be a Jew today, uh, li living as a Jew than any time in the last, you know, Maybe from the time of, of Shlomo Hamelach, there's no greater time. You know, this is unbelievable. Yeah, there were no voting rights made for anyone, right? That's the point. There was no democracy. I mean, England and whatever. Maybe Greece had a little bit of democracy, a little bit. Anyways, okay, that, that's just a, a few words. 
to um, to say for Tulal Lashon Vina, and we should uh, living in Canada. It's uh, maybe the best country in the world. I mean, leaving aside Israel, the mitzvah to live in Israel. But in terms of, uh, I think the UN always puts Canada as number one or two. It's always one of the top countries to live in the quality of life. And uh, America, the United States, I think is a little bit less, if I can say so. But it's also it's still it's a, been a wonderful country, a wonderful haven for 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 Jews and for everybody. And uh, and the uh, if you Yermiyahu tells us that God says we pray for the Babylonian government who exiled us. Call the Homer, how much more so we have to pray for our own governments. And even if it's just to prevent anarchy, um, but even more so, I think the recognize what Ramosha Feinstein says, uh, the Malchut Shal, Shal, Shal Chesed, the kingdoms of, of Aquinas and Jews have risen to power like we've never had in our history. Okay, if anybody has any critical comments, I, I maybe have bordered a little bit on politics, maybe a little too much. So usually that gets people upset. So I say something that you <laughs> like, but uh, okay, okay, we can go on in the, uh, in the, um, in the sitter. By, 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 by the way, we will, okay, you know, please go one day, we'll do the actual prayer. It's a very different prayer than that comes from 1948, you know, for Israel. And the, um, you know, what exactly the prayer, there are different prayers, but it's a sort of an interesting prayer, but that will have to leave for um, another time. Okay, let's get back to Hodu. That's where we left off. Um, we're in the middle of Hodu, so I'm, I'll try to, hopefully we'll finish up most of it or uh, as much as we can today. Okay, so just let me show one thing. I probably should have done this um, uh, a couple of weeks ago, but of course I didn't. So we'll do it now. Um, where are we going here? If I can find it. Uh, yeah, here we go. Okay. No, that's not what I wanted. Let me try this one more time. If not, a document file. Okay. Now, this is very strange. Even stranger. Okay. I don't know. I can't, um, I don't know why it doesn't share. Let me try one more time. Okay. Just give me one second. I just wanted to show you how the three-way split, how Hodu is split three different um, ways. If I, this doesn't work, we'll forget it. Uh, I don't know what happened here. Uh, okay, this should work. Sorry about that. Okay, yeah, here we go. Okay, so all I did is I just divided Hodu. This is just the Hebrew. We say this every day. I mean, some people say it every day. So it's really divides in, in, into three parts. So we're we're almost towards the end of the first part. We mentioned a, a couple of weeks ago that it begins um, after praise God, sing to him, let all the nations know, shirilo, zamrilo, sichu, sing, music, instruments, song, um, discussion, talking. Um, the first half or the first, what I have is here, the first paragraph was said when they brought the Tamid Shosh, Shoshaka. This is before the Beit HaMikdash was built. Before the Beit HaMikdash was built, where they had the Mishkan. So they would bring, um, they would say this first part when they brought the Korban in the morning. The second part, Shirul Hashem Kolar, it's the second paragraph, was said in the afternoon. And I highlighted some of the things just to point out, I mean, they're not so much, but to point out some of, of the similarities. In other words, it's really two distinct um, prayers or what, whatever you want to call it. It's from the first part is from the Breha Yamim. Um, it's really said um, that we said in, in, you know, in the morning. So Hodu Lashem Kerubishmo. So in the morning we give uh, Thanksgiving, right? Hodu is really Thanksgiving. Hodu Lashem Kerubishmo. I find this so interesting. I don't know. Somebody, somebody can, can, can tell me of those this done on purpose that that you know, you know, Turkey is Hodu, and I really don't know. I, I have no idea. Is that just a total coincidence, or it's because Turkey was eaten on Thanksgiving? I find it hard to believe that somebody came up with that because Turkey is on Thanksgiving, so they use Hodu. I don't know, but anyway. So um, we Hodu um, Lashem Shmo, and the second part begins with with Shiru Lashem Kolaretz. And this was said in the afternoon. So I just pointed out just a couple of things here. Odia Bamim. A, a, a little tough to let all the nations know the wonders of God. And here in the morning, yeah, in the afternoon, 
Sapruba You have to tell um, all the nations the, the glory of God. You have to tell them all the wonders of God. And here you have Shiru Hashem Zamulo Sichu Bechol Niflotav. Discuss all the wonders of God. Um, here you have at the bottom this Lo Inich Lish Ashkam. God didn't allow um, nations to hurt us. This is talking by by the Avot. We'll we'll get there in a few minutes. The Kapsena and then at the bottom the Kapsena Vatzilin Min Hagoyim. God should save us from the nations of the world. So uh, these were two relatively short. Now the third part, which we probably won't get to today, um, is uh, these are a series of verses in Tehillim, not from any parak. If you look in your Siddur, most of the Siddurim will tell you, at least the newer versions, the newer Siddurim, will have by the, you know, the side of the page where yes. it's at Tehillim, Ayin Chet, Tehillim Mem, Samachet, Sadik Dalit, Sadik Memba, I'll do 44, 20, 28, 33, 88, 44, sounds like a, a quarterback, 81, 144, 13, right? So this is what you have. Um, it's just a series of Sukim put together that um, they used to say, so we'll, we'll hopefully we'll get there next week. But th this is the basic structure of, um, of uh, Hodu. It's divided into three parts. And uh, one set in the morning, one in the afternoon, then you have to grow up. And these last sets of verses, basically with the same thing you'll have when we get to Ashray. If you, if you ever, you think about it, uh, some of it is praise and some of it is, is prayer. Some of it is please. Like uh, here, if you just go quickly, so Roman Hashem Elokeinu, we're, we're praising God. Roman Hashem, uh, God is exalted. We stand to bow down to him. Roman Hashem Elokeinu, we shall come to his holy mouth. Come to the slime. Quiet, please. Other, okay, um, well, that no, is okay. And uh, two oh, cheese. Hold on, I just let me. Okay, if you can mute yourself, please. Uh, there. Okay. Um, and then you have Um, and then this is more or less um a a, a prayer. We pray to God; He should not destroy us. We say this at Marif, right? You'll see a lot of a familiar psukim. This is how we begin Marif. And then, uh, God, do not take your mercy away from us. Um, remember us, um, etc. And then we talk about um, how wonderful God is, right? Um, um, uh, we, we can trust in God. God, God saves us. These are not prayers. Then we pray, O um, so it's very interesting. You have the same thing in Ashray. When if you go through it, if you think about it, where we go from praising God um, and and um, and then making prayer um, pleas to God. Okay, now this actually reminds you. Okay, all right, we'll leave that for later if we come back to that. Okay, all right. So now let's let's pick up where we uh, left off. We were um, discussing um, the breed. So. Um, here. Uh, sure, we talked about uh, it. was one we we're going to pick up on. We discussed last week. God make a, a covenant with us for a thousand generation. And we mentioned how the Torah Tamima says the Torah uses exaggeration. What do you mean a thousand generations? Uh, a thousand generations. Uh, at least uh, he was assuming the Talmudic passage that this world is going to last for 6,000 years. That's the Gemara has a famous you know, passage that the world is divided into three periods of 2000 years anybody are you familiar with this this passage anybody i'm just i'm just curious a little bit a little bit okay you'll have it you want to enlighten us you don't have to i don't want to put you on the spot but um okay so i'll, I'll just very 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 quickly the the gemara says that the the world is divided into three periods of 2000 years um the reason this became a very relatively famous uh, you know, passage, I don't know how famous today, was because it was used in the, the debate between the Ramban and Pablo Christian. It became a, uh, this became a, one of the proofs that Christians used that uh, the New Testament Christianity replaced, replaced Judaism, because this is in the Talmud itself. The, the Talmud says that the world is going to last for 6,000 years, like uh, sort of like a, a, a Shabbat. God created six days and a, one day and God is a, a thousand years is like one day. You know, we have we say that every, every, every Shabbos, a thousand years is like one day. So you have the six days of creation, that's 6,000 years. And the seventh day of, of Shabbat, that's Olam Haba, the world to come, the world of 
of Menucha. It's a sort of a you know very nice idea, although it's a little scary when you're living in the year 57. Uh, 82, and you realize that our calendar is off by 165 years. So we're really in the year 5940. Uh, I don't know, but at 165 because uh, of of the Persian period. In other words, the um, the rabbis assumed the Persian period. Rabbi Leipzig, I gave a number of shirim on this. Rabbi, the rabbis either knew and. And per, that's how, how Rabbi Schwab claims. Rabbi Schwab claims the rabbis knew they were wrong, but they did this on purpose to, to get a rid of messianic you know, you know, speculation. That's probably a, a unique view. I think most people just assume the rabbis weren't his, historians and they, they got it wrong, that, they, um, that um, they assumed the Persian period was only 52 years and it was around 200 years. So we're really, and that's why if you look at art scroll, the, the temple wasn't destroyed in 586 BE. It was destroyed like in 440 or something BCE because that's missing 150 years, 160 years. That puts it to 586. But all of academic scholarship and many, you know, it's this is accepted by many great rabbis that the academics are are correct. That's what Rabbi Schwab, of course, accepts um, that the world uh, that there's an extra 150 years. So we're really not in 5782. We're really in 59. Uh, 32 or something like that. So that's, uh, I don't know, that's not so promising if the world's going to last for only 6,000 years. But the, the, the Talmud said the world's going to last for 6,000 years. The first 2,000 years is tohu vavohu. His emptiness is, is nothingness. The next 2,000 years is Torah. Why? Because Abraham was born in the year 1948, uh, right? All those who believe in these things are very beautiful in a different calendar. Abraham was born 1948 years from creation. And the Medrash says that was the age of 52 that Abraham came to recognize God. That's so for the first 2000 years, the world is desolate. 2000 years is Tohu. 2000 years is, uh, is um, to the desolation then 2000 years of, of Torah. And when the 2000 years of Abraham end, um, and the next 2,000 years begin. So that's around, I don't know, the year around 100, 200. And so it's a, before the, around the time of the mission. It's a little bit after Jesus. That, that's what it is. And then the Gemara says the next 2,000 years are Yemot HaMashiach, or the era of the, the Messiah. And, uh, and Christians, of course, understood this to mean that this is the Gemara referencing that, you know, the Messiah was born or the Messiah lived was acknowledged, let's say, after the, two, the second 2,000 years, and we're now in the third 2,000 years of, you know, where, where Jesus is the Messiah, and we're just waiting for the second coming. Um, so this, the, this point was, it's, it's in the Gemara, it, not the part on Jesus, but the 6,000 years part is in the Gemara. And um, so um, during the debate in 1263, the Ramban, the public Christianity, he said, oh, this proves, you see, the Gemara, the Gemara, sees that Christianity is uh, is is correct. So what did the, the Ramban answer? What was the Ramban's answer to this? Right, We're here because we believe that that's not what happened. Right, We believe that the Torah exists now. We don't believe this. Uh, at least I sure hope not. And if we do, no one would be here, right? Uh, so what, what did the Ramban answer? So Ramban gave a really, really difficult answer. I think he said that the Gemara is not authoritative. It's just someone's opinion. Correct. You're right. So that's a very strange answer. The Ramban said that Agatas are not binding. Agadot are not binding. We are bound by Hadalacha. We don't care. Some rabbi has an Agatic opinion. We don't follow that. Now, that was the position of the Gaonim. The Gaonim always felt that. That's one of the differences between Agada and Halacha. Agada reflects opinions of rabbis. They may have great merit. They may have great insight, but they're not binding. They have no authority. Um, and, uh, and this is what's generally accepted you today. Uh, and there were people who do accept Agada, same value as Halakha. And of course, today, the world we live in, this view is much more dominant and the more, you know, uh, whatever you want to call it, the right wing element of orthodoxy, you know, uh, where Agada is, you know, just as authoritative Halakha. But that's not generally the traditional approach. The problem with that answer, it's like, it's very nice, but it's like, whoa. So, so. You could say, first of all, no, we understand. In other words, 2,000 years, Yimut HaMashiach just means the possibility of the Mashiach is coming. It doesn't mean he came already, what, whatever it is. But and in other words, the question is, did the Ramban fully believe his answer? Or was he just giving the answer to the, the non-Jews? Because um, the, they were trying to prove that Talmud 
proves Christianity. In other words, the Christians had two proof, two attacks on Jews in the Middle Ages. Number one was that the Talmud slanders like Christians, so they wanted to censor part of it. It's a terrible book. That was one half of their attacks on, on Judaism. You find passages in the Talmud, you know, which are, of course, critical of Christians. And, uh, you know, we had a, we put in the word akum. We, we, you know, we know there's a whole part of the Talmud that was all censored out. And, um, and so that was one attack. The Talmud is really bad. Then the Christians took a second attack. Uh, actually, if you look closely, the, the, the Talmud actually supports Christians. Very interesting, two sort of totally different track, like Rabbi Yechiel of Paris in the debates of 1240 um, uh, in, in Paris, when they burnt the Talmud in Paris then, um, and the Maram of Rutenberg composed a kina, composed a, a lament that we say on Tisha B'av, and uh, Rabbeinu Yonah said this was punishment for the Jews burning the books of the Rambam. That was the famous thing. The Jews burned the books of the Rambam in 1232. In 1240, the, the French government burns uh, tw 24 truckloads. Uh, they didn't have, have, have trucks, but whatever. 24, I don't know what, of uh, books in, they burned. And there was only one Talmudic manuscript that survived. As it far wasn't as, as if you had two or three transfers that were unsuccessful. I'm sorry. Yeah, the, there, like a, uh, uh, one or two manuscripts. And, and you had one transfer. that You had one transfer a long time ago that was successful. You had a second transfer with a, an embryo that had been frozen and okay, defrosted. I don't, and I don't think you're talking to us. Whether you, there was something. Hold on. I think that's not for us. Okay. Anyway, so. Um, um, and I think we we fast on Erev Parshat Chukat. For right. That. That's next, yeah. uh, next Shabbos. Oh, yeah, yeah. When they burnt it. Yeah. So, um. Yeah, listen. That, so it's, um, but it's Rabbeinu Yona saw that as punishment for what the, the Jews had done. Rabbeinu Yonah was an anti-Maimonidean, and then he, you know, he did tshuva, I don't know, whatever you want to call it, and he, uh, from his ways. Anyways, this is really, we're really off topic, sorry about that, but I, it's, it's, it is kind of interesting. But anyways, that, um, that's, um, the, that's more of, and the, and the 6,000 years, how the world is going to last. So I said that all because the Torah Kamima said a thousand generations, that's an exaggeration. Because he said the world's only the last six thousand years. What, what that means, we obviously don't know. And these things are not really anything we should spend time. I spent too much time on it. Like the Rambam writes, the Torah doesn't tell us anything about when the Mashiach is going to come. That's on purpose. The Torah doesn't want us wasting our time speculating. You know how the Mashiach is going to come? You know the process? When he comes, you'll know. It's a total waste of time. And I, I'm very much into this. A total waste of time. This is a Chal Gula. It's not a Chal Gula. I don't know and I don't care. Uh, who cares? Our, our, our task is to do the mitzvah of the Torah, to make the world a better place, to do staka umishpat. Don't worry about when the Mashiach is going to come. It's not a, not a Jewish approach. It's always dangerous. So it's always dangerous when we attach messianic things. And the, those who know, Rabbi Reinus, the founder of Mizrahi, was very anti messianic He wasn't a messianist at all. Rabbi Soloveitchik was not a messianist at all, right? Religious Zionism is split along these two paths. There were the messianic version of religious Zionism by Rav Cook is really the uh, father of that view that uh, this is the beginning of a historical process and divine re revelation and divine yeah yeah it's of course it's the some form of divine revelation but I don't know anything about messianic overtone but that's one half I don't know I don't know what the numbers are it's probably bigger and I really don't know but the uh, the Rav Soloveitchik and the you know and the Rav Reinus, who founded the Mizrahi, and many others, their approach was a very non-Messianic. Israel is very important. It's a wonderful thing, Zionist, but it's nothing to do with the coming of the Mashiach. It's, 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 there's a mitzvah to live in Israel. It's the only place where we can fulfill all the mitzvah of the Torah. It's the only place we can set up our own government and show how does an economic system run LP the Torah? How does a social justice system, how do you run a moral army? That's the only place we can do it. But it has nothing to do with the coming of the Mashiach. No, no. Okay, anyways, but, but let's go back here. So, um, God made a covenant with Abraham and a promise to, to Yitzchak. He repeated it. And we spoke last week the difference between Yaakov and Yisrael. He gave it to Yaakov as a, um, a, um, um, a statue to Yisrael, a permanent covenant. God made a permanent covenant with the Jewish people. Lay more. What was God's covenant? So this I want to show in the verses in a moment. What was God's covenant? God's covenant was the land of Canaan. 
I think I mentioned this last week. I may mention last week. What's fascinating is the covenant was not to give us a Torah. And and the whole the, the covenant always in Bereshit is nothing to do with there's no mention of Far Sinai. Uh, that yeah, when God say, speaks to Moshe at the burning bush, he tells him you're going to come and worship me on the mountain. But that's like a um, a stepping stone. That's just a means to an end. The end is to get to the land of Israel. The end is to imp implement the the Torah. But in in Bereshit, there's nothing about Torah. It's all about the land of Israel, the covenant with uh, God, and that's what we say here in Hodu. God made a covenant. They more Eretz Canaan. I'll give you the land of Canaan. Um, I gave it to you. Your few in, in numbers. They were only uh, a, a family. We weren't even even seventy people with Abraham. We were one family with uh, without any kids. Abraham didn't know who's going to be the person who's going to get this this covenant. And we wander from nation to nation. And we from one kingdom to another. Right? Abraham going to Egypt and going to the Plishtim and Yitzhak right. going all over the place. Yaakov has to go in into Laban's house. We had a wander. We're talking about the Avot here. That's what Hod is talking about, the Avot. But God didn't allow anybody to harm them. Now, they come to Egypt. Avram is afraid. They're going to harm them. They're going to take Sarah. That's why he <laughs> lies, right? He says to Sarah, you be my wife, right? You have to be, um, you, I'm sorry, you have to say you are my sister. Because you say my wife, they're going to kill you. And of course, the the Ramban there is very critical of Abraham, but the point is, um, God didn't let Paro hurt Sarah, and God didn't let Abimelech hurt them, and God, God appeared to them in, in a dream. So they were wandering from nation to nation. What happens when Abraham comes back from Egypt? He's very wealthy. That's what the Torah says. He comes back. He was very successful in Egypt. He had a great uh, journey. Came back. Very. That's part of the covenant. God will make us into a, um, a great nation. A great nation is a wealthy nation. Right, um, that's what some say that uh, right, Yitzchak, they, he, he had to be rich almost by 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 definition. Um, and God rebuked the um, God rebuked the, the 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 kings. That's a reference to God telling him, "Leave them alone, don't touch them, or you're going to be hurt." And then we say, "Altigubimishichai." So it doesn't mean the Mashiach here. Do not touch my anointed ones. So the commentaries explain. That what's the anointed ones? This is Avram Yitzchak. Like I, I run a lot. A king, uh, it's like um a, a king is anointed, and the avot were like kings. That's how the commentaries on the sitter. I'll take you be Mishichai. It's just it's a, a reference to the, these are the great great of the Jewish people. Ubin the eye al tereu, and do not do anything bad to the prophets. Who who are the prophets? It's referring to. So it's interesting. Some on the Otsar Hatzvilat sitter, they say the prophets ah. That's Sarah. That's the Imahot. The Imahot were, were, were prophets. Um, tomar shema, Sarah shema bakola. Whatever Sarah says, you listen to her, right? That's the, they had greater insight. Uh, the bar says, Bina Yatera, women have greater insight than men, have greater understanding. And Sarah had greater understanding than Abraham. But uh, that's how some of the commentaries, Alti Gubi Mishicha is the man. They only, the, only a man can be um, a king, Melech, Velo Malka, whatever, Bim but a woman, they can be the the prophets. And of course, that indicates a, a prophet is somebody who in, can intuit the future, can understand how what happens now, what impacts on the future. It is the whole notion of prophecy. It's not that they predict the future. I mean, often they're told by God, there's warnings, but often it's more that it's just they have a great understanding of history. Historians can tell you, you know, uh, historians tell you every empire rises and falls and there are indications always when an empire is about to fall. You don't have to be a genius to see the signs when an empire is about to fall. Uh, it's, uh, you just have to study history. So that's what prophets were. Prophets had a, a deep intuition and a deep understanding that if you continue along a certain path, um, you're going to be destroyed. It's like I say, where, you know, when the Gemara says that the temple was destroyed on, on Tisheva because of Sinat Chinam, or we didn't act, they're, they're not punishments. It's not a punishment. The, the Gemara is just saying, I mean, whatever they mean, we can talk about it more at, an, at, a, at another time, but really what it means is that a society where people don't get along, not acting with Nimesh Ruddin and Sinat Chinam and baseless hatred are very similar. Flip sides of the same coin, not going the extra mile, not, not always, you know, Lifnimish Ruddin, 
I'm not going to do exacting, always take everything out to me. I have to be a little more giving. I don't have to insist on every little last penny. That's Lifli Meshur Hadin. And the Talmud says, that's why Jerusalem was destroyed. They didn't act Lifli Meshur Hadin. That's so similar to Sinat Chinam. I don't like you, you know, for no reason. I'm not willing to help you. But that's not like, oh, God punished us for that. It's no, a society where no one is willing to give others the benefit of that, where no one is willing to give of themselves, even though they have a legal right to something, then um, that society can't survive. So it wasn't, it was really more, so it was more hi history lessons. It was, a, it was a class in in history than when the rabbis say the reasons for the temple was destroyed. But anyways, Sham, we very all to raise. So I just want to show you um, a couple, the, the verses um, about the breach with Avram, what I was saying before. Uh, so let me do this here. Okay. Uh, let me uh, share. Okay. Hold on a second. Where are we going? I tried a new way to share, but I see I, I, I don't know what I was doing. So, we, okay. Genesis 15 15. Okay. So here's the first breach. This is the chapter 15 in uh, Sefer. Chapter 14 is the war of the four kings and the five kings. Was that the one in the Chumash? Not for now. Okay. And God, uh, uh, Avram says, you know, I'm, uh, I don't have any kids. Like, I just have Eliezer. He's going to be my inherent to me. So God says, go up, uh, count the, the, all the stars, and you, you're going to have a lot of seeds. So the first covenant or the first promise of the covenant is we'll be a numerous people. Yes, God later on in the book of Devarim says, I didn't choose you because you had big numbers. I chose you because you're a very small nation. But clearly the goal, the first thing God says when he's forming Abraham into this great nation is you're not going to be, you're going to be so numerous. The Jews are going to be so numerous. You won't be able to do a census of, of the Jewish people. And then what does God say? I took you, it sounds like, the first of the Aserat had that he brought. Ani Hashem Asher Hotziti Chamei Urkastim, right? Anochi Hashem Asher Hotziti Chamei Eretz Yisrael. Latet the the Anochi Hashem Asher Hotziti Mi Mi Beit Avadim, right? But he, it sounds very similar. Hotziti Chamei Urkastim. Latet Lachat to Eretz Yisrael. Why did I take you from Urkastim? Not to give you the Torah, but to give you the land of Israel. And then. Abraham says, how do I know? And the whole discussion there. And then God makes the covenant to breach Ben Abdurim. And he says, you know, you're going to be slaves for 400 years in a land that you don't know. Uh, and the, only the fourth generation will come. But it's all about the land of Israel. Okay. And then, um, and okay, Sarah doesn't have any kids. They go. So then you look in, in Bereshit 17. I mean, this we should know, but uh, often it's good to look in the Chumash. We we often forget the Psukim and we often don't pay attention. We're too busy in, in rushing the Midrashim. Um, so Abraham is 99 years old and God says, um, you know, come with me, walk me, I'm going to make a covenant with you. Again, what's the breed? That you'll be a great nation. You're going to have a lot of children. Okay. Um, you're going to be an Avraham on Goyim over and over again. You'll be, and you're not going to be Avraham. You're going to be Avraham. Oh, why Avraham? Because you're going to have a lot of kids. Avraham, Avraham on Goyim. We needed that hey. It's like an acronym. Avraham is an acronym. Avraham Hamon. The hey is Hamon. Many, many nation. Like it's like so repetitive in many ways, right? I will make a um, a breach with you. And I'll give you Eretz Megurecha, Eretz Knan, Lachuzat Olam, Ve'iti Lachem Lelohim, I'll be your God. And Bayom Relohim Ele Avram, Vatap Ritziti Shmor, you should keep my covenant. Ach, achar Ledortam. Now, what's the breach? So here, uh, this is Himo uh, Lachem Kos Achar. Now, what does that mean? Hold on. But only men have that. Right, only, only men have a breed in law. So the key is, and I know Rabbi Liptak has has pointed out, the breed the breed milah is not the covenant. The breed milah is the ot breed. It's the sign of the covenant. Mm -hmm. It's the sign of the, it's not the covenant. It says when our term words by yalu ot like like tefillin. Why do we word tefillin? Tefillin is an ot. Tefillin testifies, or or Shabbat is an ot. Shabbat is a way we. We give, give, it's a symbol of our relationship to God. Of course, we have to do it, but the, it's really a means to an end. It's a way to demonstrate our, our commitment to God. So the Brit Milah is not the covenant. The Brit Milah is just the ut, is just the, uh, is the, uh, the sign of the covenant. The covenant is God's going to take us to the land of Israel. He's going to make us in, in numer, a, a very uh, large nation. That's the covenant. Now, 
God's going to want us to get the Torah so we can live our moral life. But the, the Torah is man, like, uh, I, 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 it's people don't like when you say it like this, but in, in, in many ways, the Torah is a means to an end. In other words, the goal of the Torah, I always like the, my best quote unquote proof for this, if I can use that term, is when the Rambam discusses, um, should we do mitzvah because we want to or because we have to, right? Do, is it better, right, to do mitzvah? I don't want to do the mitzvah, but oh, God commanded me, I'll, I'll do the mitzvah. So that shows, wow, I'm a, a religious. Let's say, I, let's, say I, let's say I don't like pork. So I don't eat pork. What's the big deal? I'm not doing any mitzvah. It's only a real, it's only a real mitzvah. I love pork. So that's a discussion. So what, how does the Rambam, what does the Rambam say? Is it better to do mitzvah because you're, you really don't want to do the mitzvah, but I'll do it because God commands it. So that's the highest level of religiosity where they say, no, uh, I should do the mitzvah. What do you mean? If God commands it, I, I, sh I should want to do it. So how, how does the Rambam deal with that? I think the first way. Okay, and who thinks the second way? It should be the second way. I'm sorry? It should be the second way. So, of course, it's both. It depends, like everything, right? Uh, you know, when, when I came into Rav Shachter Shir, the, the first year I came into Shir, so he would ask a question, and someone would say, Machloket, it's an argument. And then whenever Rosh Shachter would ask questions, he would he would always, he, he has a, a great sense of humor, if you know him. Uh, he would always say, of course, everything's a machloket. Uh, all you do, any question, just answer, it's a machloket. Even in the Ramam, it's a machloket. And you'll be right. And then he told us about this guy, I discuss, uh, he said, uh, uh, but there was a guy lashing this year, he knew who was a machloket between. It's one thing to say it's a machloket, because you know two people argue about it. But if you know who argues about it, ah, that's something special. So the Rambam, he doesn't argue with himself, although the Rambam does do that on other occasions, but the Rambam actually splits the mitzvot into two, into ritual and ethics. And the Rambam writes that um, when it comes to rituals, um, um, more or less, uh, that when then we should do the mitzvah because God commands us. A Jew should want to eat pork. We should want to eat pork. You know why? Because there's nothing wrong with eating pork. Eating pork, you can be the nicest person in the world, the most moral, ethical person in the world. You can be a Jewish person who eats pork on Yom Kippur. You can be the most um, um, pie, uh, not pie. You can be the most um, ethical person in the world and eat pork on Yom Kippur. So there's nothing wrong with eating pork. Ah, God said, don't eat it. That's what makes it wrong. That's the only thing that makes it wrong. So the Rambam says, not only is it okay, the Rambam actually seems to say it's better. It's better. You should have a desire to eat pork. You shouldn't say the wrong right. You shouldn't say, EFG, I don't want this. Ugh, it's disgusting. No, say it's delicious. I wish I could eat it. But when it comes to tzedakah, when it comes to helping people, or it comes, don't, don't steal. I wish I could steal. I wish I could cheat on my taxes, but I'm not going to cheat because God said so. Uh -uh. The Rambam says that's really bad. No, no, no. You have to develop your ethical personality that you would never want to cheat or, or or steal right I, I i wish i could kill that guy but i won't because i'm going to go to jail or i won't because god said so so that's not right so what what what's the rambam telling us the rambam is really telling us that the goal of the torah is not to keep the mitzvot at least the goal of the torah is to keep is we can, can become an ethical person the Torah is a mechanism for how we become an ethical person. In other words, the goal isn't, oh, I keep the Torah. Really, really who, who, who cares? As long as I keep the Torah. The ultimate should be, well, I'm keeping the Torah because God says so. Why do I give staka? Because God says so. No, that's not why you give staka. You give staka because it's the right thing to do. How can you see somebody in pain and hurt and you not help them? We mentioned before the beautiful idea of the maharal. The Mar, um, where it says in Torah, Im kesef talved ami, if you lend money to your neighbor. So Rashi quotes there, this is one of three places where im doesn't mean if, it means when. The, uh, if, if you give, no, 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 that's, what do you mean if? If you can afford it, right? I mean, you, you, you're obligated to give somebody a loan. So what do you mean you're obligated? The Torah says if, so Rashi says, no, no, no. If doesn't mean if, if means when. He quotes, of course, our, our sages. He didn't make that up. If means when. So the, the obvious question is, well, then say what you mean. <laughs> what do you mean? If the Torah says if, why should we say it means when? Uh, the, the Torah can say ki. Why do I say im? So the Maral answers because the Torah wants us to give stuck, not because we're obligated to. 
The Torah wants us to give staka because we should feel we're a volunteer. We give because we want to, not because we have to. That's why there's no bracha. There's never a bracha on a mitzvah between man and man. I don't keep the mitzvah to make a bracha. First of all, can you imagine? If I, I told you already a few weeks ago, I mentioned the story. When people came to visit Rafutner, Rav apparently, when he was in the hospital, she said, ah, now we can do the mitzvah. A beaker calling Rafutner says, get out of here. I'm not, uh, um, go go shake your your." your lulav somewhere else. In other words, we don't visit people in the hospital because it's a mitzvah. It is a mitzvah, but that's not why. We do it because it's the right thing to do. And that therefore we never make a, a bracha and a mitzvah between man and man. Pork, there's no there's no right or wrong in pork. Why can't I eat pork? Why can't they eat in Yom Kippur, right? So, so um, that we do because God, we demonstrate our religiosity in those areas, but in the ethical areas. So that, that to me is a proof how the Rambam for sure understands that at least the ethical portions of the Torah are meant as a means to an end. They're not uh, that, the, 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 so it, it's the same thing here. The Torah is very important. It's our lifeblood. It's, uh, you know, but not, not as an end in the Torah itself, because the, the Torah makes us better people. Or when the Gemara, well, and with this, I see it's getting late. The Gemara has a debate. What's more important, learning or, or doing? The Gemara in Kiddushin, is Talmud more important? Is to, to sit and learn in Kola more important or to be involved and in, to do uh, mitzvot? What's more important? So the Gemara says they debated this for three years. This one said Talmud, this one, I, I, and then they came to a conclusion. What's the conclusion? The conclusion's like this. The conclusion is Talmud is greater. Learning is greater because learning leads to action. So what's greater? Action's greater. The method to get to action is learning. When you learn more, I mean, that's, that's a question. Is is that really true? Does that really work? When you learn about something, are you more likely to observe it? On a certain level, yes. But what the Gemara is saying is, is learning is important, not, not in and of itself, because it leads to action. In other words, if learning doesn't lead to action, it's not real learning. That's not uh, that's not learning Torah. Learn, learning Torah, lo model made lishmor velasot. Lo model, we say the Navah Rabbah every day. Lo model lishmor velasot to keep. It's not the goal; it's the learning. Learning is very important if it leads you to action. So, anyways, that that's the so it's the same thing. The Brit that we say every day in Hodu. Right? We don't really think about these things. We I, at least I don't. We we well now I do a little bit, but we ramble through it. Um, no, so in Malachi Ten Eretz Knan, God's breed is to have the land of Israel, because only in the land of Israel can we set up that ethical society. We have an army that's ethical and an economy that takes care of the poor, and we make sure there are no homeless people, and we're concerned for all citizens, and we treat the stranger properly. Over and over again, the Torah tells us the thirty-six times how to treat the stranger. That means when you're the in power in Israel, uh, don't treat the non-Jews the way you were treated. Right? When don't don't treat the Egyptians like we were treated in Egypt. We have to be better than other people. So um, that, that's what we say. And God took us from nation to nation. It, it took a long time, 400 years. But the goal, the breed that God made was to become a great nation in the land of Israel. Okay, let's just do a very quick review and then I'll take any, any questions. Um, happy Canada Day. That's how we started. And then we discussed, of course, um, um, the Tefillah Lishlom Hamidina comes from Yirmiyahu. It's then picked up in Pirkei Avot. And in the Middle Ages, it makes it into our, our Siddur as a sort of a formal prayer. Um, it's clear. And even though the governments we're praying for are not nice to us, they exiled us and maybe even murdered us. Um, and they went to, to, to Bavel. The Jews have to go to Bavel. We have to pray for the welfare. We have to live there, live, live nicely, build homes, big gardens. You don't have to sit there and exile and mourning your own life. Lead, lead a normal life and, and pray for the government. It's good. It's good. Otherwise, people leave each other alive. And, Rev, and that's the same thing with the owner of Rev, Rev Moshe took it to another level because he's living in America. Uh, the greatness, escaping from Russia, communist Russia, to come to America. Wow, what a malchut how ama amazing it is. So the, the, the media, and it's not this practical thing, so we keep safe. It's this sort of um, great Thanksgiving that we have to have. And that's why Rev Soloveitchik would end sheer early on Thanksgiving Day, because he would promise his sister always, that's apparently, we had go to his sister's for Thanksgiving dinner every year, and he felt it's important enough that he would end sheer early. I know he probably started sheer an hour earlier too, whatever, but he ended sheer early, so he could have Thanksgiving dinner. Uh, if you see uh, anybody they used to do at, um, I think of the Spanish Portuguese school, maybe the Jew at, at KJ, I, I have to get a, a copy of that, the whole formal service on Thanksgiving, uh, like a whole davening, a special tefillah, 
that they would say on Thanksgiving. We today have, I think, have 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 lost that. I also think, by the way, we we flipped the Rambam. What I ended off with on its end. Most of us um, pay our taxes not there because we want to. And a lot of people have to be arm twisted to give, you know, you know, charity. You know, you give to me, I give to you, and you got to go to the dinner. I have to go. We we often don't give because we want to. Law well, often, sometimes we do, of course. But um, um, many of the mitzvot. Many of the ethical mitzvot we have to press hard. The ritual, nobody here. I, I don't know. I don't know. Anybody want to eat pork? I have no desire to eat pork. I'm in violation of the rumbum. The rumbum says I'm supposed to want to eat pork. I don't want to eat the, the, a cheeseburger. I don't know. We've done the exact opposite of the rumbum. Ugh, I would never violate Shabbos or not eat trait. Uh, you know, business, uh, maybe I'll cut corners a little bit. So we're supposed to be the exact opposite. Okay, and then we we talked about how Hod is divided into three sections. The first section said in the morning, the second section said in the afternoon. There are a little bit of parallels, praising God, God, God singing unto God, extolling us within the nations. And the third part, which we'll get to, uh, we did already a, a little bit, uh, just a, a distillation of many, many verses in Sefer Tilim. Some of the verses are, are praising God and some of the verses are prayers to God. And the same thing we'll see in Ashra, you go back and forth between, but it's really three totally distinct sections of Hodu that, you know, you look in the Siddur, they don't really divide it that way. That's not even the things the Chazan says out loud, but that's the, uh, the old... Um, that's really how we, it, it divides. And then we discuss the brief, the, the covenant that God made, how long the world's going to be, a thousand years, two thousand years, find that idea. It was Agada, you know, how binding is Agada, and that whatever the Talmud means, this idea the world will last 6,000 years, and maybe it doesn't mean it at all practical. It, 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 we don't know. As the Rambam says, don't worry about any of these things. We'll know when the Mashiach comes, we'll know. And then we can figure out how we came. But the, not the, we never should speculate. That's not a healthy thing. And the breed that God makes with Avram Avinu is the breed to become a great nation, a great nation meaning great in numbers and great in quality and in quantity and that can only be done in the land of Israel and that's always what the breed always refers to Israel and then then the way to do it is through the Torah the Torah of course is our our, our lifeline it tells us how to keep the breed but it says the Rambam says it's sort of a means to an end okay uh, I want to thank you very much let me quickly go through questions okay good morning thank you yes happy can they and can english and french baruch hashem american jewish women have the lowest fertility rate of any ethnic group good i mean yes oh you're saying the covenant that is true jews uh okay we don't follow the torah always what can i say right jews are we're always super liberal i mean unfortunately and i really this is so sad the total more and greater separation between the orthodox world and non-orthodox world it's very sad that uh, we, we have so little in how we vote, uh, how Orthodox Jews vote, how uh, non-Orthodox, in so many areas, there used to be much more, I think, of a community sense. And I think how the Orthodox have grown in numbers and power and influence, they sort of feel like we don't need the non-Orthodox anymore. I don't know, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's sad, but um, okay, that's my um, opinion. Yes, uh, Danny said, in the UK, we have a prayer for the Royal Family, Paris Bar Hashem, okay. After the Italian fascism and the Italian Jewish community stopped saying a prayer for the government. Yeah. Home. Good. Yeah, yeah. So right. I, I said there are exceptions, right? And in conservative synagogue 10 years ago, President Bush was publicly condemned from the Bima or Shana. So that's in a, in my humble opinion, that's in inappropriate. We we it it's also speaks to this sort of the I don't want to call it arrogance. We feel too much at home in here sometimes. I don't know. I, I I don't know where you draw. It's okay to criticize, of course. That's our democratic right to protest. But I don't know. I don't think a pulpit on Rosh Hashanah is. The, first of all, I think it it's silly. I think I mentioned the comment a couple of weeks ago. Norman Lamb, Rabbi Lamb, wrote it in in tradition. I, I don't remember where. I remember reading it many years ago. He wrote, you know, he's a young rabbi, maybe even not as a such young rabbi. He would get up and you know in the battles in the 60s, the 50s, the 60s, the big battles between the conservative and the orthodox movement, Mechitza and all these other battles. And he would lambat the conservative movement doing this wrong, that wrong. He said, I don't think one person became more observant with one extra mitzvah because I lambasted the conservative movement. And what 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 do you gain from that? Even if it's true, what what, what do you gain? That's not the shul should place. There's, yes, rabbis can talk about turn to back. It's not turn every day what a rabbi should talk about from the pulpit, but I'm just saying, I, I think it's in, inappropriate. I think what the halakha says, that's inappropriate. That's my opinion. You can feel free to disagree. Why do Jews re-pray for a head of state when they live in countries engaged? Oh, what do Jews pray Yeah, when you don't know who the head of the country is? So you pray for the, you, you don't mention names. You should pray for, for, for peace. Yeah, I don't know. 
I agree. Yeah, yeah, um, I, yeah. I, you pray that that the, it's worse than they should live in a normal country. The lower side is all gentrified today. Yeah, I haven't walked around there so much. That's very nice. I guess it's, are are there are there, a lot of Jews have moved back to the lower side. No, correct me if I'm wrong. I don't live in New York, so I'm not totally up on what's going on. Oh. No. No, have, are Jews moving back to, to, no. to the Lower East Side? No. No, not. Okay. Uh, Shave Israel is a unique nonprofit organization taking assistance to the Jews of the Lost Tribes. Cool. Okay. Now, I don't know who they are, but okay. That's it. Listen, are the Ethiopian Jews from Dan and all these things? I don't know. It's interesting. The Mishnah in Sanhedrin claims that the 10 tribes are never coming back. There's, there's, there's a mission in Sanhedrin, like the sun sets. Or I forget how the Gemara, the mission explains it. They're lost permanently. Okay, so we don't, that's an agadic mission. We don't have to follow it. It's not a what, whatever, but it, it is interesting. Obviously, they didn't know. There are no voting rights in Spain. Yes, in America, the probabilities of one children and grandchildren be Jewish are the lowest in recent history in Judaism. I don't know if that's true. I mean, yeah, we have a higher intermarriage rate. Yeah, maybe it is true. I don't know. Uh, although, yeah. Yeah, listen, assimilation is uh, it's a big, big problem. That's why the Orthodox have to step up. The Orthodox have to be more, um, more, not just look after their own interests. They have to know how to lobby for Israel. There was an article in Chakira a few, a few uh, years ago. Um, I forget who wrote it, you know, the Flatbush. It's, it's sort of right-wing modern Orthodox, whatever. So, you know, people, many of them live in sort of, you know, it comes out of Flatbush. Um, so there was a whole article with the Orthodox influence in, in, increasing. We have the Orthodox community is going to have to take on jobs we've left for the reform and sort of lobbying governments. And I know the OU has a little bit of a, a farm, but so much of the communal work has been done by non-Orthodox Jews. And as they unfortunately um, assimilate, and less of them will be involved, uh, the Orthodox have to step up and take over roles they haven't done. On the other hand, like I've often mentioned uh, today, um, Bar, Bar Hashem, I, 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 that's probably not the right word to use, but um, many intermarried Jews, it's, not, it's no longer a necessity one-way ticket out of Judaism. It, today, you can be into, it's rare, but it does happen. You can be intermarried and still be involved in the Jewish community heavily. I teach kids like this every year in, in chat where only one parent is, uh, is Jewish. I think most, many of them probably did convert, maybe not halakhically, whatever, but um, that's a new phenomena that uh, you can intermarry. We don't sit ship anymore. Like I mentioned, and Tova, if you remember, you wouldn't let me send out that article years ago that, that I wrote. You wouldn't let me send it out, and I never sent it out, and now I lost it. I wrote an article years ago that in 1851, when, um, I'm sorry if I'm going late, anybody can leave, feel free, but this is just extra talk. But in 1851, when the Binyan of Yaakov Ettinger wrote a tshuva about how we deal with non uh, machal Shabbos, those who violate the Shabbat. So according to the Talmud, a Jew who violates the Shabbat publicly has the status of a non-Jew. His wine cannot be drinking, drunk. He cannot count for a minyan. He should be he's worshiping idols. He's so it's pretty bad. It's, it's worse than intermarriage in the Talmud to, uh, to violate Shabbat. And yet today we welcome all Shabbat violators. We have entire movements dedicated to inviting people to your house. And the great Puskim said you can invite them even though you know they're going to drive to your house on Shabbos, etc. etc. Um, et, et the Binyan Sion said the social contract isn't true. In the time of the Talmud, maybe a Jew who violated Shabbat, that was a demonstration He doesn't believe in God, because everybody understood Shabbat and God go together. Today, that's not true. Jews, they, they drive to Shul. What are you going to say? They, they don't believe in God, they're worshiping God. That's not true. They drive to Shul. It wasn't a halakha, the one who violates the, the Shabbat, it's like he's worshiping idols. It was a social reality. And he said that that is, has changed. That's no longer true. And therefore, we can have a totally different attitude to Rechala Shabbos. Without that tshuva, there'd be no Baal Tshuva movement. Judaism would be so different. So I claimed in an article that I wrote, and my sister censored me, if I can say that. Uh, I don't know you would censor me now, but 15 years ago when I first wrote it, uh, how intermarriage is the, the Chilo Shabbos of 150 years ago. Today, we should be more welcoming to just like we welcome the Sabbath violator, and uh, we have a new attitude. It the, doesn't mean they're rejecting. We should have that same attitude towards intermarriage, which halakhically speaking is less of a technical halakhic violation than Ooh. the Kilo Shabbos. But uh, that, that's considered so, you know, intermarriage is always, oh my God, that's the last thing you're out of here. So Tova, it's because of you, you have to find the article somewhere. Maybe look in your old emails and send it back to me. Okay, okay. anyway, so that, so, so 
it, yes, there it is terrible. And most Jews who intermarry are lost, but we should reach out to them. We should reach out to them. They sh we don't have to lose them just because they're intermarried. They, I mean, it's, they'll be hard, but we can go after them. Okay. Wonder about Hodu, name for India. Oh, also, can, oh yeah, I didn't think of that one. Connection Thanksgiving with Native Americans, then referred to as Indians. Whoa. Whoa, it's very fast. I have no idea. We need a, what's it called? The person who's a, a linguist. We need a linguist here to go on. That was very interesting. Europeans thought turkeys originated in India. Okay, there you go, Morris. Thank you. In French, it is a dinda, din from India. You all, of course, are, should all be thankful that there were no rabbis in America in the 1600s, 1700s, because nobody would be eating, eating turkey if that was the case, because there is absolutely no reason turkey should be a, a, a kosher animal. I don't mean to say that. I'll eat turkey. I mean, I don't eat it much, but uh, the OU gives us kachet to turkey, but that's the quirks. You know, Jew, halacha has its own way of, of working. It's, it's next to impossible to imagine rabbis would have allowed turkey. There's no masora. There was no tradition, which is what you need on a bird. It's a little bit wild. But since by the time rabbis came to America, Jews were observant Jews were eating turkeys, rabbis found excuses or heterim to allow it, which is a very common technique of rabbinic Judaism. So anyways, if you can be thankful for that, otherwise nobody would be eating turkey on Thanksgiving. Okay, now I know we're not, I'm not a follower of the Rebbe. I'm not sure what I said that. I'm not a follower of the Rebbe, but uh, the Rebbe did wonderful things. I, I think that one of the sad things of our generation is, you know, we, we either totally agree with somebody or totally disagree with somebody. That's a terrible thing. We can, uh, I've said that many times. We can see the greatness in things and we can disagree with things. The Rebbe was, uh, nobody was a leader like the Rebbe. I mean, look at Lubavitch today. Unbelievable. Everywhere. Do I like a lot of what Lubavitch does? Absolutely not. But, but do they do amazing things? Absolutely. And that's true with everybody. I don't agree with Rav Aaron Cutler's philosophy of Judaism either, but he did amazing things. He, he built up a whole unbelievable thing. He did some wonderful things. I, I, I don't agree with every Truman from Moshe either. You know, it's not from Moshe at certain things, but you're great, 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 great people. I listen, that's, uh, you know, that's not the way you don't have to agree with everybody. So I'm not a follower of the Rebbe, but uh, the Rebbe was a great person and like all, you know, and whatever. Okay. How do we incorporate that in the current scientific understanding of time frame of the emergence of human ancestors? I don't understand the question. I'm sorry. I don't know what that is in the current scientific understanding of the time frame of you or the 6,000 years. Yeah. So uh, I'm assuming that's the 6,000 years so presumably presumably what it means is that um um that uh that the sages in the gemara had no reason to believe the world is 15 billion years old right in other words we who know evolution even though the the, the ramban himself hints at it but why would anybody living in the in the 1200s think the world is billions of years old that, 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 there's no reason to think that now we know science so okay so we can think that so i, I that that's a question that's an, anachronistic that uh, the current right it, it doesn't fit with the current scientific understanding that the world is billions of years that is is correct. To refine our personality, I assume, yet yeah, that's why we keep the, the Torah. Can we infer that part of God was, the part of God's was for us to be scattered around the world for a time? Absolutely. I mentioned that a couple of weeks ago. Shishim Rav Hirsch loved that Gemara. Gemara Imsachim said the reason we were into exile was to bring Torah to the nations of the world, to wow. spread ethics to the world and i explained that now you don't have to in the 1500s and it's uh, for 2000 years yeah you, you had to live among people to influence them today you come online there are people from all over the world even now uh, here i don't know where everybody lives but they're it's unbelievable you don't have to live in 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 the exile to influence so that was my sort of like like tweak but that's what what she from father her said that was one of the reasons he was non-zionistic until the messianic period because our we have a role jews have a role to be in the exile to bring morality around the the world to spread morality but uh, today you don't need to live them you can live in israel and do that you need a little bit in person too yes is certain yeshiva mir they learn topics specifically which have no current application yes yeah i understand that's um it's really late i don't want to keep people even though i i, I appreciate people who stay very long let me mark down morris's question because i see he's not even on so to pick up next week right the, they learn the shema so to be not practical. So obviously, yeah, that's, we'll have to talk about that. I made a comment about fertility relating to your remark about being the best society. Oh, 
it's still the best place for, it's the best time for a, a Jew to live. You, you, you want to be living in 19th century uh, and you want to be living in Tsarist Russia, this is the best time to live. Yeah, freedom comes with problems. I understand for Jews, it's the best time. Maybe not for, for, for Judaism. Just like I said, intermarriage is great for Jews, but bad for, for Judaism. I, I, I agree. Um, um, you know, but um, yes, it, that is very sad. But still for those who are Baruch Hashem, uh, you know, living today, it's the best time to live. Okay, Moshe made a second press. Which he said, okay, okay, thank you very much. Rambam has his own version of the breakdown that differs from Chazal. Okay, so I have to take a look at that, but Yochevet, you're not here anymore, right? Okay, I'm sorry to go so late. Okay, yeah, there are a growing number of Jewish needs children of intermarriage. Yes, uh, that we, uh, it's not a simple issue to deal with when they're not halakhic and Jewish. It's not simple, but um, I'm glad they're involved in the Jewish community. And, uh, you know, this is the new notion. We'll end with this of Zera Yisrael, you know, that I, I don't consider a product of a non-Jewish mother and a Jewish father like to be the same as a goy off the street. That's a concept that Rav Am Amsalana, who was used to be part of Shas, who left, who wrote a two-volume book about this, about we have a hal an intermediate category. We're not halachically Jewish, but you're still kind of Jewish. That's what we call Zeri Israel. You come from the seed of Israel. And why that's important, that's his argument. Halachically is we should have much, much, much more lenient standards in conversion of these people. They don't have to, I mean, it's a whole debate how our standards sh should be, but that's for another time, but someone who's a Zeri Israel, that's his argument that we would make. That argument has not caught on in many segments of the Orthodox co community, but, um, oh, the Mashiach, the Rebbe. Yes, I don't believe the Rebbe is the Mashiach. Yes, that is correct. Um, so, um, so right, we have to deal with it, but I, 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 I much prefer the kids of a non-Jewish mother and a Jewish father to identify as Jews than to uh, um, assimilate. It does create a little bit of a challenge and how we're going to, you know, what we're going to do and then what happens when your son marries, wants to marry their daughter, um, whatever. So we have to deal with it. Anything good in life becomes challenges. Okay, it's very late, but as you notice, the, the school year is over, so I had the uh, ability to go a little bit over time. So I, I don't know if I should apologize or what, because I, I feel bad. I don't want people to have to stay, but I also don't like to not answer the Pretty questions. Interesting. Thank you. Okay. Okay, everybody, thank you very much. Have a Shabbat Shalom. Um, Sunday, Rabbi Liebtag begins his new series on Yirmiyahu, when politics and religion collide. And like I said yesterday, that's unfortunately all the time, because religion and politics are not supposed to mix. But so he just gave a little taste from Yirmiyahu. I have no idea what he's going to be talking about, but, you know, I can uh, go there. He, he doesn't uh, spell it out maybe as frankly as I do sometimes. He's a little bit more diplomatic and circumvent in his uh, views. I'm a little bit more open sometimes. I don't know that's good or bad, but that's the way it is. Okay, everybody, thank you very much. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Thank you. Kodesh tov. Thank you. Kodesh tov, right. And tomorrow, of course, is the yard site of the Rebbe. Did did I, I? Oh yeah, that's why I mentioned him. I think I mentioned right tomorrow. It's also the yard site of our uncle. I'm I, I've yard site on Monday for my father, but my uncle Wolf who was, uh, uh, worked in the uh, in JTS, the head of the rabbinical assembly for many, many years, the only job he had in his life for over 40 years. So his yard site is the same day of the, the, the Lubavitcher Rebbe, but that's just a uh, family thing for, for Tobin and myself, who, who knows. Okay. See you next week? Yes, please God, we'll see you next week, yeah. You're not going on any trips? I am going on a trip. I am, please God, I'm going to Portugal on our trip. I hope to be able to give the class from Portugal, but uh, we'll have to see. I, I, you know, I don't like to skip classes. I think people here know that. Um, so the problem is I, it may conflict. So some, uh, we'll, we'll see, we'll see what that comes up, but please God, no, no, we'll be in, in, in two and three weeks, we'll be away, but not, not this week. So now I'm home. Okay. All right. Have a good Shabbos, everybody. Thank good you Shabbos. very much.